Good morning, friends. We're on chapter 11, The Supreme Measure. Capital punishment has had an up-and-down history in Russia. In the code of the Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich Romanov, there were 50 crimes for which capital punishment could be imposed. By the time of the military statutes of Peter the Great, there were 200. Yet the Empress Elizabeth, while she did not repeal those laws authorizing capital punishment, never once resorted to it. They say that when she ascended the throne, she swore an oath never to execute anyone. And for all twenty years of her reign, she kept that oath. She fought the Seven Years' War, but she still got along without capital punishment. It was an astounding record in the mid-eighteenth century, fifty years before the guillotine of the Jacobins. True, we have taught ourselves to ridicule all our past. ridicule all our past. We never acknowledged a good deed or a good intention in our history, and one can very easily blacken Elizabeth's reputation, too. She replaced capital punishment with flogging with the knout, tearing out nostrils, branding with the word thief, and eternal exile in Siberia. And let us also say something on behalf of the Empress. How could she have changed things more radically than she did in contravention of the social concepts of her time? And perhaps the prisoner condemned to death today would voluntarily consent to that whole complex of punishments, if only the sun would continue to shine on him. But we, in our humanitarianism, don't offer him that chance. And perhaps the reader will come to feel in the course of this book that twenty or even ten years in our camps are harder to bear than, there, than were the punishments of Elizabeth. In today's terms, Elizabeth had a universally human point of view on all this, while the Empress Catherine the Great had, on the contrary, a class point of view which was consequently more correct. Not to execute anyone at all seemed to her appalling and indefensible. She found capital punishment entirely appropriate to defending herself, her throne, and her system. In other words, in political cases such as those of Mirovich, the Moscow Plague Mutiny, and Pugachev. But for habitual criminals, for non-political offenders, why consider capital punishment abolished? Under Paul, the abolish abolition of capital punishment was confirmed. Despite his many wars, there were no military tribunals attached to military units, and during the whole long reign of Alexander I, capital punishment was introduced only for war crimes that took place during a campaign, 1812. Right at this point, some people will say to us, what about deaths from running the gauntlet? Yes, indeed, there were, of course, hidden executions for that matter. One can literally drive a person to death with a trade union meeting. But the yielding up of one's God-given life because others, sitting in judgment, have so voted, simply did not take place in our country, even for crimes of state, for an entire half-century, from Pugachev to the Decemberists. The blood of the five Decemberists whetted the appetite of our state. From then on, execution for crimes of state was no longer prohibited, nor was it forgotten, right up to the February Revolution of 1917. It was confirmed by the statutes of 1845 and 1904 and further reinforced by the criminal statutes of the army and navy. And how many people were executed in Russia during that period? We have already, in chapter 8 above, cited the figures given by liberal leaders in 1905 to 1907. Let us add to them the verified figures of N.S. Togenstad, the expert on Russian criminal law. Up until 1905, the death, of death penalty was an exceptional measure in Russia. For a period of 30 years, from 1876 to 1904, the period of the Narodnaya Volya revolutionaries and the use of terrorism, terrorism which d did not consist merely of intentions murmured in the kitchen of a communal apartment, a period of mass strikes and peasant revolts, a period when the parties of the future revolution were created and grew in strength. For 486 people were executed, in other words, about 17 people per year for the whole country. This figure included executions of ordinary, non-political criminals. During the years of the First Revolution, 1905, and its suppression, the number of executions rocketed upward, astounding Russian imaginations calling forth tears from Tolstoy and indignation from Korolenko and many, many others. From 1905 through 08, about 2,200 persons were executed, 45 a month. This, as Tagenstev said, was an epidemic of executions. It came to an abrupt end. When the provisional government came to power, it abolished capital punishment entirely. In July 1917, however, it was reinstated in the active army and frontline areas for military crimes, murder, rape, assault, and pillage, very widespread in those areas at that time. 
it was one this was one of the most unpopular of the measures which destroyed the provisional government the bolshevik slogan slogan before the bolshevik coup d'etat was down with capital punishment reinstated by kerensky a story has come down to us that on the night of october twenty fifth and twenty sixth a discussion discussion arose in smolny as to whether one of the first decrees shouldn't be the abolition of capital punishment in perpetuity whereupon lenin justly ridiculed the idealism of his comrades he at any rate knew that without cap capital punishment there should be no movement whatever in the direction of the new society however in forming a coalition government with the left srs he gave in to their faulty concepts and on october twenty eighth nineteen seventeen capital punishment was abolished nothing good of course could come from that goody goody position yes and how did they get rid of it the beginning of nineteen eighteen trotsky ordered the alexei shotsny that alexei shotsny a newly appointed admiral be brought to trial because he had refused to scuttle the baltic fleet parklin the chairman of the verk trip quickly sentenced him in broken russian to be shot within twenty-four hours there was a stir in the hall but it has been abolished prosecutor Kalenko explained what are you worrying about executions have been abolished but shotsny is not being executed he is being shot and they did shoot him if we are to judge by official documents capital punishment was restored in all its force in june nineteen eighteen no it was not restored instead a new era of executions was inaugurated if one takes the view of the lapsus is not that lapsus is not deliberately understating the real figures but simply lacks complete information and that rev tribunals carried in approximately on approximately the same amount of judicial work as the Cheka performed in its extrajudicial way one concludes that in the twenty central provinces of russia in the period of sixteen months june nineteen eighteen to october nineteen nineteen more than sixteen thousand persons were shot which is to say more than one thousand a month this incidentally is when they shot both krustalev nosara the chairman of the nineteen o five st peter st petersburg soviet the first russian soviet and the artist who designed the legendary uniform worn by the red army throughout the civil war however it may not even have been these individual executions with or without formally pronounced death sentences which added up to thousands and inaugurated the new era of executions in nineteen eighteen that stunned and froze russia still more terrible to us was the practice initially followed by both warring sides and later by the visitors the victors only of sinking barges loaded with uncounted unregistered hundreds unidentified even by a roll call naval officers in the gulf of finland in the white caspian and black seas and as late as nineteen twenty hostages of lake Baikal. this is outside the scope of our narrow history of courts and trials and it belongs to the history of morals which is where everything else originates as well in all our centuries from the first ryerick on had there ever been a period of such cruelties and so much killing as during that post-october civil war we would omit from view one of the char characteristic ups and downs of the russian capital punishment story if we neglected to mention that capital punishment was abolished in january 1920 yes indeed and some students of the subject might conceivably be at a loss to interpret the credulity and helplessness of a dictatorship that deprived itself of its avenging sword when denikin was still in the kuban the cuban wrangle still in the crimea and the polish cavalry were saddling up for a campaign but in the first place this decree was decree was quite sensible it did not extend to the decisions of military tribunals but applied only to extra extra judicial actions of the cheka and the decisions of tribunals in the rear in the second place the way was prepared for it by first cleaning out the prisons by the wholesale execution of prisoners who might otherwise have come under the decree and in the third place it was in effect for a brief period four months it lasted only until the prisons had filled up again by decree of may twenty eighth nineteen twenty capital punishment was restored to the cheka the revolution had hastened to rename everything so that everything would seem new thus the death penalty was rechristened the supreme measure no longer a punishment but a means of social defence from the groundwork of criminal legislation in nineteen twenty four it is clear that the supreme measure was introduced only temporarily pending its total abolition by the all-russian central executive committee and in nineteen twenty seven they actually did begin to abolish it it was retained solely for crimes against the state and the army article fifty eight and military crimes 
and true for banditry also. But the broad political interpretation of banditry was well known, as well known then as it is now, from a Central Asian Basmak right up to a Lithuanian forest guerrilla. Every armed nationalist who doesn't agree with the central government is a bandit, and how could one possibly get along without that article? Similarly, any participant in a camp rebellion and any participant in an urban rebellion is also a bandit. But where articles protecting private individuals were concerned, capital punishment was abolished to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the revolution. And for the 15th anniversary, the law of seven-eighths was added to the roster for capital punishment, that law so vitally important to advancing socialism, which guaranteed the Soviet subject a bullet for each crumb stolen from the state's table. As always happens at the start, they hurried to apply this law in 1932 and 33 and shot people with special ferocity. In this time of peace in December 1932, while Kirov was still alive, at one time, 265 condemned prisoners were awaiting execution in Leningrad's crusty prison alone. And during the whole year, it, had, it would certainly seem that more than a thousand were shot in Kresti alone. And what kind of evildoers were these condemned men? Where did so many plotters and troublemakers come from? Among them, for example, were six collective farmers whom nearby, from nearby Tarskoy Selo who were guilty of the following crime. After they had finished mowing the collective farm with their own hands, they had gone back and mowed a second time along the hummocks to get a little hay for their own cows. The All-Russian Central Executive Committee refused to pardon all six of these peasants, and the sentence of execution was carried out. What cruel and evil Saltichika! What utterly, utterly repulsive and infamous serf owner would have killed six peasants for their miserable little clippings of hay? If one had dared to beat them with birch switches even once they would now they would know if one had dared to beat them with birch switches even once we would know about it and read about it in school and curse that name but now heave the corpses into the water and pretty soon the surface is all smooth again and no one's the wiser and one must cherish the hope that some day documents will confirm the report of my witness who is still alive even if Stalin had killed no others, I believe he deserved to be drawn and quartered just for the lives of those six Tarskoy Selo peasants. And yet they still dare shriek at us, from Peking, from Tirana, from Tibul Tbilisi. Yes, and plenty of big bellies in the Moscow suburbs are doing it too. How could you dare expose him? How could you dare disturb his great shade? Stalin belongs to the world of... Stalin belongs to the world communist movement. But in my opinion, all he belongs to is the criminal code. The peoples of all the world remember him as a friend, but not those on whose backs he rode, whom he slashed with his knout. However, let us return to being dispassionate and impartial once more. Of course, the All-Russian Central Executive Committee would certainly have completely abolished the supreme measure as promised, but unfortunately what happened was that in 1936 the father and teacher completely abolished the All-Russian Central Executive Committee itself. And the Supreme Soviet that succeeded it had an 18th century ring. The supreme measure became a punishment once again, and ceased to be some kind of incomprehensible social defense. Even to the Stalinist ear, the executions of 1937 and 38 could hardly fit into any framework of defense. What legal expert, what criminal historian will provide us with verified statistics for those 37 and 38 executions? Where is that special archive we might be able to penetrate in order to read the figures? There's none. There's none and there never will be any. Therefore, we dare report only those figures mentioned in rumors that were quite fresh from 1939 to 40 when they were drifting around under the Butriki arches, having emanated from the high and middle-ranking Yezov men of the NKVD who had been arrested and had passed through those cells not long before. And they really knew. The Yezov men said that during those two years of 1937 and 38, a half million political prisoners had been shot throughout the Soviet Union, and 480,000 Blotny, habitual thieves in addition. The thieves were all shot under Article 59.3 because they constituted a basis of Yagoda's power, and there, thereby the ancient and noble companionship of thieves was pruned back. How improbable these figures, taking into consideration that the mass executions went on not for two full years, but only for a year and a half, we would have to assume under Article 58, in other words, the political, 
in other words, the politicals alone, an average of 28,000 executions per month in that period in the whole Soviet Un for the whole Soviet Union. But at how many different locations were executions being carried out? A figure of 150 would be very modest. There were more, of course. In Saikov alone, the NKVD set up torture and execution chambers in the basements of many churches and former hermit cells. And even in 1953, tourists were still not allowed into these churches on the grounds that archives were kept there. The cobwebs hadn't been swept out for ten years at a stretch. Those were the archives they kept there. And before beginning restoration work on these churches, they had to haul away the bones in them by the truckload. On the basis of this calculation, an average of six people were shot in the course of one day at each execution site. What's so fantastic about that? It is even an understatement. According to other sources, 1,700,000 1, had been shot by January 1st, 1939. During the years of World War II, the use of capital punishment was occasionally extended for various reasons, as, for example, by the militarization of the railroads, and at times was broadened as to method, from April 43 on, for example, with a decree on hanging. All these events delayed, to a certain extent, the promised full, final, and perpetual repeal of the death penalty. However, the patience and loyalty of our people finally earned them this reward. In May 1947, Isaf Bizaryanovich inspected his new starched dicky in his mirror, liked it, and dictated to the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet the decree on the abolition of the capital punishment in peacetime, replacing it with a new maxim, maximum term of 25 years. It was a good pretext for introducing the so-called quarter, but our people were, are ungrateful, criminal, and incapable of appreciating generosity. Therefore, after the rulers had creaked a creaked along and eked out two and a half years without the death penalty, on January 12, 1950, a new decree was published that constituted an about-face. In view of petitions pouring in from the National Republics, the Ukraine, from the trade unions, oh, those lovely trade unions, they always know what's needed, from peasant organizations. This was dictated by a sleepwalker. The gracious sovereign had stopped to death all peasant organizations way back in the year of the Great Turning Point, and also from cultural leaders. Now that is quite likely. Capital punishment was restored for the conglomeration of traitors of the motherland, spies, and sub subversives diversionists. And of course, they forgot to repeal the quarter, the 25-year sentence, which remained in force. And once this returned to our familiar friend, to our beheading blade, and once this return to our familiar friend, to our beheading blade, had begun, things went further with no effect, effort at all. In 1954, for premeditated murder, in May 1961, for theft of state property and counterfeiting, and terrorism in places of imprisonment. This was directed especially at prisoners who killed informers and terrorized the camp administration. In July 1961, for violating the rules governing foreign currency transactions. In February 62, for threatening the lives of, shaking a fist at, policemen or communist vigilantes, the so-called Drusiniki then for rape, and immediately thereafter for bribery. But all of this is simply temporary until complete abolition. And that's how it's described today, too. And so it turns out that Russia managed longest of all without capital punishment in the reign of the Empress Elizabeth Petrovna. Have a good day, friends.